Okay, so today we are finishing Genesis chapter 8. We're only looking at two verses today, uh, but two very important verses right here at the end of the flood. So will you stand as we read Genesis chapter 8, 20 through 22. 20 through 22. I forgot to pray. Lord God, speak this morning. As we, as we sang, Lord, speak, renew our hearts, renew our minds. Lord, remove me out of the equation, Lord, and only may you speak, Father. May your words be not man's, Lord. May your spirit speak to each heart in ways that only you can do. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not see. So we have this wonderful scene, right? I, I, I encourage you to continue to think cinematically, if you can, of what's happening in the Bible, of just Noah and his family in the ark going through this great flood and the dark nights that they've experienced and the hope that they've had to hold on to remember that but the remembrance of the Lord, right? And finally, they've come to rest. And finally, the waters are receding. And finally, there's life that's being shown. But you can only imagine that as they're beginning to step off the ark, all that's going through their head. And as we looked at last time, the idea of them coming off the ark is this reverse uh, liturgy, in a sense, of entering the temple. They're entering a new creation. It's this new setup of this new Adam, right? He's come with his animals and the blessing of God. So they step out into this new creation, these new animals. But I said, imagine their thoughts as they looked around, as they saw the debris, perhaps, right? Well, that probably have no idea where they actually are. Who knows? The chaos that they might be feeling. Uh, just every in uh, indication of judgment around them in some levels, right? You can think of the bare hills, right? The uprooted trees. You've seen, many of you may be able to experience firsthand what a flood can do to things. Water is powerful. It's powerful. And it can mess stuff up quickly. So you can only imagine, but it's the, the sense of chaos, and it's this new picture. It's a blank canvas. And so I think it's apt, and I think it's smart for us to think about this for ourselves, because we use the changing times and the seasons are good markers for us to begin things new and to look at things differently. And of course, many of you might have New Year's resolutions and you start out the New Year thinking, okay, this is what I'm going to do. What's the New Year going to be all about? How should I start this year? What's the way I can better myself this year, right? And here we have Noah. Imagine the resolutions that might be going through his mind. He's, he's, the, he's the new Adam. How are things going to be different? With everything that's behind us and all that we've gone through and all and, and how the way that the world got to, you know, the amount of the pressure that you think that was probably mounting upon Noah. How I don't want to screw this up. I can already like I don't want to see things get to the place that they were at, right? I don't want to be the one responsible. So how will he begin this new year? How will things be different with him? That's a big that, that's the question that we're being asked to ponder as a reader. We're going to see this answer in part of thinking in the, the form of God's thoughts, right? We're trying to make us think about God's, God's thoughts here. What will be Noah's first steps, right? Will he begin some self-care, right? Will he uh, go to call his nutritionist? Will, uh, you know, will he begin to organize his garage? Will he do a long range? He can imagine his right? We know that Noah ends up with a very successful vineyard. And uh, will he begin to do his long-range planning and set his goals and, and get his budget set for his family, right? All the different things that he needs to do and itemize. But what's the first thing we see Noah do as soon as he steps off the ark? Verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Noah built the altar of the Lord. Noah's first action, before putting anything down on his boat, before setting any goal or calling his nutritionist, he's going to have trouble finding him. <laughs> Noah's first action was to worship God. For everything must start with grateful worship. And that's really what worship initially is. It's this response. And we, we have this listed out in the four R's of the church. It's to receive what only God can do. His salvation is working, right? That he delivered the ark safely. That he has caused you to be reborn again. What's our first thing we can do and only do is respond. Receive. Receive and respond, right? Gratitude. Or you brought me and my family through what just was the most insane thing I've ever witnessed. What else can I give? What else can I say? But to start here, Lord, I don't want to be the one to screw this up. I'm God puts in you. It's on you, right? He builds an altar to the Lord. Because our, our worship is the source. It's the only sure foundation of living. It's the only proper response to God's saving grace, right? This is Paul's great argument in Romans. In spite of what shall we say because of these things, right? To offer our bodies. What can you give that he hasn't already given us already? What, you know, what can you give the good father but yourself? And so that's Noah's response. To give him glory. To recognize what he has done. To make much of his power to save. And Noah, like us, is saved to worship. You know that? Why is the Lord saved you? To worship. Why is He created you? To worship. And what is worship? Enjoying God. Knowing God. Being in communion with God. This is this is the hallmark of the Reformation. What's the chief end of man? Glorify God and enjoy Him. But for that to happen, of course, sin has to be dealt with. Because that's what separates that reality. So Noah's worship displays, of course, his praise of being rescued. But there's more, isn't there? There's more that goes on in this sacrifice. And it's the beauty of our worship today that more than just it's gratitude, but also recognition of what the Lord has done for us. Of what we need from that. And here we have the beginning, the blueprint for a new relationship with God. Just notice, here's this conversation you're pulled into. No one is saved. And he builds an altar to the Lord. And then God says, never again will I destroy the earth this way. Because now man is holy. Is that what he says? No, it's not what he says. Never again will I destroy the world's way because man is evil from his youth. Because man is not perfect. Because even in Noah, there is probably some thoughts like, does he know who I am? Right? And if God had to send a flood for every time man sinned, there would be a constant deluge. So something is different. God is choosing in His goodness and His grace to provide in a different way. That's a key theme here that sets up the whole Bible, and that is this idea of atonement. Of a covering. Atonement means to cover. Of a substitute. Someone who can cover for you for a period. So that God can have some level of relationship with us in His holiness. The key issue of human sin is only partially dealt with by the flood. It kept humanity from self-extinction. That was his problem. It was actually a saving word, right? Yes. It kept humanity from self-extinction, but it did not deal with the problem of the human heart. The heart is still wicked. God says it himself. Even Noah knew this. And we're going to find out that Noah has does some strange things. This issue will need to be dealt with, but in a different way. 
So Noah brings a sacrifice. And, only, and this actually, I believe, is part of the command. We don't have everything that God said to Noah, but we know God said to Noah, you need to bring these extra animals, these extra clean animals, right? And so only now does Noah say, oh, okay, perhaps this is because of, we don't know the whole sacrificial system that Noah was involved in or what Cain and Abel, what these kind of sacrifices were. But here we see, for the first time, a burnt offering, an atoning offering being brought to God by man. He understands now why God told him to bring an extra pair of clean animals. Noah brings a burnt offering, which is what the text says. And remember, this is Moses speaking back on the text. So the, the, the Israelites would know exactly what kind of offering this is, even though Noah might not have called it a burnt offering. That's what it was. That's what its function was. And that is a blood offering. We learn in Leviticus uh, chapters 1, 5, and 9, in the Mosaic community, this was an offering for sin. It was an atoning sacrifice to God for sin. In this offering, unlike many of the praise offerings, or entering the court's offerings, which maybe a part of the priest or the people will get a portion of, this entire offering is burned up. It shows total devotion. It's a painful offering. It's a costly offering for your sin. Nothing is left for the priest even or the offering to have. And such an offer, as I said, it shows total surrender. And I said this is the first time a sacrifice is specifically mentioned in the Bible. And it totally makes sense. In this way, Noah, right out of the gate, as his new Adam figure, acts as a priest for himself, for his sin, and the new humanity. And graciously, which is the paradox, a strange thing, because if you just read this, Never again will I do it. Man, except for what is going on here. God in His grace, which has been the plan all along, receives the sacrifice, as it says, as a pleasing or own. Pleases Him. And this is this, this, the beauty of the sacrifice, which is the need for justice, but also God's grace. And it's upheld in the sacrificial system, but of course it's going to be Perfectly upheld in Christ. But you, some of you might think, well, this is awfully barbaric. This seems awfully pagan. What's going on here? And I ask you to think deeply about it for a second. Has anyone wronged you? Has anyone ever hurt you? If someone, if someone were to come up to you, excuse me, or totally random right and punch you in the face, right? There's a part of you that goes, there needs to be justice here, right? This is where someone. Part of you, or if someone was to, you're in a village and burns down your village or steals from you, right? You have this, there's a natural sense of justice that is needed. Now, we've done that to the Lord in our sin. And for, if, you're, if, you're, if you're standing before a judge and someone has deeply wronged you, stole from you, hurt, murdered you, and the judge just goes, and the judge looks at the person who did that to you and says, I'm just feeling gracious today. We're, not, we're just going to let you go. Right? You, the person who's been wrong, are going to feel indignation. Right? You're, where's the justice? Now, how can God both forgive us and be gracious, which he must, because we're all that guilty person, and also provide a level of justice? Well, that's seen here through the sacrificial system. But something must pay. Blood is required because of sin. Because I remind you that we, we way undervalue sin. All sin is homicidal and suicide. It cries up to God. And through sacrifice, God is able to appease, to show that sin is serious, and it needs to be judged, but also God is gracious. And you're not having to pay the blood price. But as we're going to learn, these doves and pigeons and lambs is never enough. Only for a period. It's only so that we can have this tiny face time with God at some level through the tabernacle and temple system. What, what is coming? Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the earth. Right? The perfect God, God's own provision. God's own land. Who pays the price. Who took the wrath of God. Who takes upon the justice that was intended to be brought towards you so that 
that many favors of God can be called, Paul says, both just and justified. And this, this entire understanding is being set up here. And so don't let anyone try, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of people who come to the Bible with such critique says this is barbaric, and they, they totally miss the depth, the beauty, and the reality of what's going on here in the sacrificial system. What God is presenting here. So amazingly, we see that the sacrifice and the surrender of a righteous one, and remember Noah is called a righteous one, even though we know he's not perfect, he's seen as a man of faith. And because he's faithful, we see that his sacrifice before us as a good priest, as far as a human can do it, that somehow his sacrifice and his surrender compensates or covers for the wickedness of the human heart. His mediation and his substitutionary atonement that he brings Substitute covering for the enemies. God has, we see right here, the gospel is proclaimed to us right here below. God has provided a way to work with sinners only because he graciously humbles himself to become fully involved with humanity. And it does not stop here because the incarnation is coming. Now the pain and indignation of God is assuaged by the atoning sacrifice. Put its place upon him. And this sacrifice causes God, and this is kind of the divine conversation that we're, we're, we're seeing through the author. This sacrifice then causes God, in his goodness and grace, to commit, instead of to judgment, to forgiveness as the new beginning. To commit to grace. And he's been committed to grace. We're seeing it here, but it's been grace since Genesis chapter 3, when he says, Through you I will crush the serpent, right? This is the covenant of grace, as we know. That even though there are laws and stipulations, it's all grace. You're not saved by them. You're saved by grace. By trusting that God will provide. To trusting that I, I, I bring everything before Him, I follow after Him, because He is doing the work. And God says He will never treat the ground, and actually the word here for curse is not the same as someone being cursed, is actually to Treat something with contempt. The word is Allah in the Hebrew. There's two different kinds of forms of curse. So God essentially says that he will never again treat the ground as if it were cursed. And in fact, instead of bringing curse, him being cursed, he will bring blessing. Commentator James Hamilton eloquently puts that however irregular the human heart may be, there will be regularity in God's world and in itself. A quick, I thought it was interesting, is where does the ark land? Well, the Bible says it lands in the mountains of Ararat. In the mountains of Ararat. Here's a little picture uh, of the map of where, where uh, geography, uh, Mesopotamian geography, believe in the mountains of Ararat. Mount Ararat, which is in present day Turkey, uh, uh, Turkey, Turkey and Armenia. Turkey and Armenia is about you know, it's a 16, 15,000 foot mountain. It's the tallest mountain in the area there. Um, and it was only named Mount Ararat in the Middle Ages, okay, because of this story. So there have been many ark hunters and things that have gone to that mountain looking for the ark. I'm, I'm just personally going to say you're not going to find the ark, okay? The ark could have landed on any of these mountains in this area. Okay, it's the mountains of Ararat. And the name Ararat, so like I said, was only named after the fact because of the story. And here's another thing. If you land on an ark, and the whole world, there's not a lot of trees, are you just going to leave the ark there? No, you're tearing that puppy down. <laughs> okay? And if not you, many other people have torn it down. All right? Anyway, I digress. If you want to look for the ark, that's fine. I'm just saying, it's probably not on the ark. But the reason I say all of this is, is because of the name. Ararat. Mount Ararat, the name, literally means the curse reversed. On the mountain where the curse was reversed. And this is the beginning of this long story of sacri sacrifice, atoning sacrifice done on mountains, with particular names regarding mountains. Okay? <coughs> 
And so the curse here is reversed, uh, and actually it speaks to this prophecy that was said of Noah by his father, right? That he will bring rest to the ground. And here, because of his first, his first atoning, mediating sacrifice, God's forgiveness and his grace begins to come in. Begins to reverse all things. And from here on out, from this mountain to the mountain of Calvary, right, will come this great reversal of the curse of sin. And it's seen right here on this first mountain of mountains. And the promise of God is to never again destroy all humanity is what the patriarchs must come back to again and again. To remember when, when Moses says, remember, when he's telling God to remember, he's pointing back to this moment is what he said, his promise, his covenant. The same this will be for uh, Abraham. He's coming back to God's goodness. And God wants his people. He, he, he urges and works with them to understand. Remember that promise? Remember his commitment to grace and to forgiveness? This is what Moses says. When God says, stand back, Moses, I'm going to destroy these people. I'm going to wipe them all out. And Moses says, no, remember? He said, you wouldn't. Because you're good. God had every right to. He had every right to. But Moses pleads to his character. He says, but God, it's not who you are. And God goes, of course. It's not like God remembers. It's not God going, all right, yeah. It's God saying, I'm going to wipe you out, aren't I? No, you're not, because you can't. That's right. And, it's, it, 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 and we see this a lot in Scripture because it's a way for us as a reader to come into the conversation and to go, but wait a minute, flip, 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 flip. Didn't he say? And the author is going, yeah, that's why I'm asking you, that's why I'm giving you the question. You're supposed to flip back and go, this doesn't make sense, because it doesn't. That's why God says exactly. And he says, I'll show you all my goodness. I am slow to anger, abounding in love, remembering my promises for a thousand generations. Amen? Amen. So the story of the Old Testament is a story of people that need a perfect mediator, a sacrifice, and a king. For no one and no thing can fully deal with the heart issue besides this. So what we see with Noah is one example, as I said, in the larger unfolding pattern, that is various mediators offering sacrifice for God's people on mountains. There's a beautiful theme here. Leading to the ultimate anointing, atoning, Substitutionary sacrifice. Jesus Christ who will suffer for his people. So you have Mount Ararat. You have Mount Moriah. You have Mount Sinai. You have Mount Moriah and the Temple Mount again. Was the, the temple. And then you have Calvary, right? The mountain outside of the city. So the final sacrifice on the mountain is brought. I hope you see that this, this is the kind of stuff. Like I said, I was talking to a Ukrainian man who came here. Uh, he came to America and was a, got a master's in piano. And he was an atheist up until five years ago. He was telling me his story. I said, well, what changed? He said, it was the Bible. It was the person of Jesus. He said, when I read the Bible, and I really read it, I realized that this, you can't make this stuff up. There's something here. He said, the, the links and the prophecies and the referencing, he said that how the, the continuity in the Bible between the Old and the New Testament. So I was blown away by it. And then, of course, when I came to the person of Jesus, there's no man like this. Who is this man? Who speaks with authority in this way? And he said there was truly something divine. And of course, we began you know, kind of having that personal relationship with the Lord. It was just a wonderful story. But it was through the Word of God. And I hope that the reason I'm, I'm going through these details not to bore you, I hope, but to show you, wow, look at the, the beautiful symbolism, but also the reality, the truth, the correlation <clears throat> over all of these different authors, over 4,000 plus years of time, and how well it's put together. Right? And these covenant mediators and their son all leading up to Christ. And you can see now, in hindsight, Right? Reading in the Old Testament. Christ all over, do you not? You see Jesus in his presence. You see Jesus and the hope for him in every passage that we've read. We have in Noah's sacrifice a reminder that sinful humanity always requires mediation with God. 
as shown by the shadows of the past, as Colossians John Calvin said. Now, however, the manifestation of Christ has taken away these ancient shadows. So finishing up, I was trying to find a picture to really kind of describe what Noah must have looked like coming out of the ark with his family, right? And really, any kind of picture of someone who's been rescued will do. And so I, I, I remember this story. Anyone remember the Chilean mine disaster in 2010? Yep. yep. When these 33 coal miners were stuck 2,300 feet under the mountain. 33 of them. They spent 69 days in the pitch dark down in the mountain. And this is a picture of their, their form. <laughs> Got any more sunglasses, right? Because they're just so bright. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, this is a picture of no. <laughs> oh, yes! Well, no, no, no. And everyone, and all 33 of them survived. Well, there's a lot that happened here. Let me just read you. These miners, when you look at the story, it's powerful. Because there's, there's some great symbolism here to our story of Noah. These miners held a prayer service twice a day when they were down there. There were several Christians down there that were part of the leadership. And during the two months, this is taken from an article, during the two months that they were trapped, during the two months they were trapped, Quez was, conf was confident, that is, one of these uh, Christian leaders, was confident God would save them. The miners began to also feel the presence of the Holy Spirit with them as they prayed. They saw physical healings take place. Reconciliation between brothers that had gone undone for years occurred. And God provided nourishment just when they needed it most. God, many of them said, was the 34th mile. It was amazing to watch the Lord respond to us, even in the dark. We began to see what God was planning to do with each of us. This is, this is like someone talking about being in the ark, right? In the church. That's what I hear from you guys. That was the reason we could be tranquil. We could have peace and be united together. One week before being rescued, 22 of the 33 miners gave their life officially to Christ. Jose Herquez said that when the time came for their rescue, before any left the mine shack, the group came together and prayed, thanking God for saving their lives. They prayed for blessing over the capsule that would take them to freedom and greatly rejoiced together and they finally made their way above ground. And many of them agree that their foreman, who we saw a picture of, Luis Verzula, who was the leader of these, was worked tremendously with the men on top to keep the men together. Right? He worked and helped them work this, this bit down. They're going to get this, this, this amazing you know, machinery and stuff that they did to get them out of here. And, and this leader really held them together. And the leader of the 33 Chilean Myers, uh, like I said, Luis Rizzo, was the last among them to emerge from the flawless rescue operation the night before. And he conferred with the Chilean president who had been there working with them, speaking directly with them through radio. And after their leader, their foreman, steps out of the capsule, he comes up to the president and says, I've delivered to you this shift of workers. As we agree on work. And the president replied, I gladly received your shift because you completed your duty, leaving like a good captain. You are not going to be the same after this, and Chile won't be the same. In this story, I see a wonderful picture of a little shadow. Uh, first, Moses' mediation as a good form for his family. Right? And, and he delivered, he was obedient to what he was supposed to do, but God, God delivered. But ultimately, this is the picture of Christ. This is the picture of Christ, our chief form, while we're on this ark together. Amen? Delivering his ransom bride to the Father. As he agreed to be with. Amen? Amen? And the Father will say to those that are in this ark, under the leadership of Christ, I accept. I accept these men. I accept your work. Amen? 
And that's the beauty of this, the Father, and the, 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 all these pictures that we see with Noah, that through Christ's final work, God has etched in the human heart the new covenant, which is a promise. That by the Holy Spirit, the Lord has created a people that are obedient. Amen? Through the Holy Spirit. This is promise that even though we are imperfect, He has etched on our hearts a new reality. That is a people who, like Noah, before doing anything else, worship God. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. Who receive His salvation and respond in gratitude and in praise and in repentance before doing anything. And that's our reminder this morning. Many of you have lists and plans and things you need to do for the year. And my, my simple message, in spite of all this, is before you do anything, worship God. Before you do anything, enjoy the Father. And I don't mean tasks, and I don't mean going through the motions. I mean coming before the Father. Lord, thank you for your salvation. Lord, forgive me of my sins, and show me where you are at work, and how I can join it. I am yours. This is how you start the new year. This is how you are to start every day. Because the Lord is gracious. Do you know what kind of storm you've been plucked out of church? Do you know what kind of boat you're in? The first and most important job of a spouse, of a friend, of a parent, of a teacher, of a co-worker, of a pastor, and of a Christian is to fall in love with the worship of God. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's to love to worship God, whether it's here at home, over there, across the sea, wherever you're found, to be a worshiping person because you can't impart what you don't possess. As John says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. But we have the chief captain, the foreman, who says, I am to deliver as I said I would. He will not lose a single one in his flock. So church, what are we to do while we're in this heart? While we follow our, our good captain and our good foreman? We'll live in obedience. Because no longer is Noah our mediator. Amen? No longer is Moses our mediator, or David, or any other saint from the Bible, as they call him. It is Christ. Christ the perfect one. We are His new covenant children. And as obedient children, says Peter, do not conform to the evil desires you have in living ignorance. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, Paul says, holy and pleasing to God. Live on fire. So I think by saying this, are you confused this morning? Are you indecisive? Are you overwhelmed? Are you at a crossroads? Are you in a new chapter, perhaps? <coughs> are you feeling like you're at the end? Where do you start? What do you do? Psalm 43 says, I will go to the altar of God. To God be my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with a liar. Oh my God. There is nothing more important, church, than going to the altar of God. I end by saying this. There are times I, I meet a lot of people on their deathbed. A lot of people that are on their deathbed, and they're going to be on their deathbed maybe for another year, two years, three years. People that I've been talking with in this very church that have been kept in, in, in nursing homes and they just can't get out and they say to me, Pastor Lou, why am I here? What is my purpose? And I sympathize with that. That is hard. And everybody would be asking that question in that position. All right? It's, 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 it's a challenging place to be, especially when you're a person who has done things, has led things, has been active. And they say, what is my purpose here? And it doesn't take long for when they start to be that the fir your first purpose, and don't, I do not, this isn't trite, this isn't trying to be dismissive, but your first purpose, your most glorious purpose, even here on your deathbed, is to worship God, is to seek Him, is to know Him more deeply. And I have seen individuals that have felt hopeless of purpose, 
go from when they begin to say, turn to the Father, and He begins to unveil and reveal and change their hearts so marvelously in ways that had not happened in 90, 95 years previously. Some of the most powerful work God will ever do happens in these last moments. It doesn't have to be that way. But that's the power of worshiping God. It's not just like, oh, come on, Pastor. Give me something I can do. And I'm telling you, the number one thing you can do that people avoid all their lives because they're so busy is worshiping God. Yes. Right? And we, and the, the, the devil would have us so busy we never worship. So let's hear as the psalmist says. I'll go to the altar of God with exceeding joy. I love when I came to the house of the Lord with a shout. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, what else can we say, Lord? Lord? We are so thankful, Lord. We lift our arms and praise just as someone who's been rescued from a deep mine. This is what you have done. And Lord, we thank you that we are in the fold and the flock of our great captain who will deliver us, who has delivered us. So Father, we come to worship you today and every day, Lord. May our lives be on fire, for it's only in the burning that the pleasing aroma goes out. So Father, may we be true to what Paul tells us to offer our bodies to you, everything to you, Lord. Show us where your word and how we can join you, Lord. We won't go. We, won't, we don't want to take a step until the command of the Lord tells us to step. So, Lord, direct, lead, and guide in the name of Jesus Christ.